Well, this is a uh, weekend, a special weekend for some appropriate greetings. So, happy Labor Day weekend to all of you who have gathered this morning and are listening online, and then happy birthday weekend to Phoebe. Now, let's think about Labor Day weekend. Labor Day weekend is an opportunity for us to reflect, to uh, be refreshed, to be renewed, to rest, and to remember. And for some of us, it's remembering work experiences over the years. So I remember that job. Now, I had a little work as a boy. I was in the uh, pop bottle business. Um, friends and me, we would go out looking for pop bottles and ditches, um, and we would uh, turn them in for the deposit. And then a little while after that, I had a paper route. But I remember kind of my first real job. There was a fellow in our church who asked if I would like a little job at the car dealership where he worked. I said, great, I'd love to. And the Saturday that I was assigned to work, I was wondering, what was I going to be asked to do? Maybe I would be test driving the new vehicles. I had just turned 16, I had my license, I thought that would be a good assignment. Maybe they'd have me selling cars. I know I was young, but I, I thought I had a way with words and could be persuasive. So I thought maybe that's my assignment. And then, and then I wondered, how long till I get a personalized business card? And then I wondered, when would I get an office all of my own? Well, I dressed up packed a, a lunch, and headed to the dealership that Saturday. I met Bob, the fellow who uh, asked me to work there, but we didn't stay inside. He took me outside, and we walked right past uh, all the new cars that were for sale, and at the back of the dealership, there was this lot. It was abandoned and quite desolate and it was overrun by weeds. And uh, Bob, the fellow who had uh, hired me, said, John, what we'd like you to do is pull all these weeds between the cracks and the pavement. Um, I was not dressed appropriately. I was given no equipment for the job, and the sun was blazing hot that day. So there I was in the back uh, parking lot of the dealership, where it would seem nobody ever went. And here I am pulling these weeds. And after about a couple of hours, I'm thinking, this is not the job for me. And during the course of the, the day, I had several quitting points. And then when I went in for lunch, I discovered this was not a long-term job. In fact, this was a, a one-off deal. Uh, I was hired for the day, and uh, I realized pretty quickly I was cheap labor uh, in terms of what I was going to be paid for the day and how many hours it took. I'd love to give you a real happy ending to the story, that it ended up being the best experience ever. But I did experience an attitude adjustment during that day, and I remember thinking at one point, um, I, I need to be working as on to the Lord. And I did learn a few lessons that day. Uh, one of the lessons I, I learned that day was um, that helped me into the future was that work is not always pleasant or enjoyable. There's times work can be quite challenging. Uh, the other thing I developed that day was a tremendous empathy for people who have jobs where there's a lot of drudgery and uh, uh, even a sense of uh, the job being demeaning. So I've always been supportive of 
You know, those guys who scoop up poop after horses at parades. Or, um, you, you know, those young men and women who will wear those placards uh, that say, turn here for Joe's flowers. I resonate, and I think back to my experience, and I, I want to honk my horn or cheer them on as they're doing that kind of, uh, that kind of work. The other lesson I learned was a real appreciation for the kind of work that I am passionate about and gifted to do. And uh, I learned there is a distinction, and it's okay to focus at times on that kind of work. Then a final lesson that it cultivated back then, it's developed over the years, is to really search out role models of excellence at work. Now, whether the work is at home, you might be a homemaker or you might have a lot of work you do at home given your situation. Um, we want to respect the pursuit of excellence in that kind of work. Uh, maybe for you, work is in a business or in a factory. Uh, for some of you, as we've mentioned, it's returning to school in a classroom. And I'm especially thinking of that work that we sometimes refer to as church work. And it's for that reason it brings us to a special woman who I would propose is a role model of excellence at work. And her name happens to be Phoebe. Now, you need to know that uh, we have a niece, Phoebe, who turned 20 yesterday. Phoebe lives in B.C. and Phoebe, if you're listening in this morning, happy birthday. Um, some of you know that one of the Boyle children, her name is Phoebe. And some of you can remember back a few years ago, there was a popular sitcom on TV with a quirky character. Her name was Phoebe, a show called Friends. But today we're looking at Phoebe, this woman in the Bible who is, to me, a wonderful example of a good worker, even, I would say, a, a leader uh, in the context she was in. I saw the other day a little girl, she was wearing a t-shirt that simply read, Girls are the future. And I thought to myself, well, it's kind of neat. This Sunday, today, we're going to the past and a woman that I hope encourages all women, and uh, to that regard, all of us who've gathered here today. I was intentional in mentioning that Phoebe was not only an excellent worker, but a great leader in the church. I think back to a book someone gave me years ago. The book was simply titled, Leadership is Male. So, is it okay for a woman to lead? Can a woman lead? Should a woman lead? Be it in a business? Be it in a school setting? And what about the church? I'm looking around today and most of you know that in some settings that's a controversial question. It's open to some debate. And today I don't want to get bogged down with that. Although we'll make reference to it. But I think there's a danger of us overlooking some wonderful insights from this woman named Phoebe that should encourage and inspire all of us as we conclude today our summer mini-series, Women You Should Know. And so I would ask the question, what is it that we should know about this biblical woman named Phoebe? If you've got your Bible... Turn to Romans. We're going to look at all the passages in the Bible that talk about Phoebe. So we're going to likely be here for quite a while as we look at every Bible reference to Phoebe. Let's begin with Romans 16, verses 1 and 2. The Apostle Paul writes, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Sacaria, I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people 
and to give her any help she may need from you. For she has been the benefactor of many people, including me. And that's it. Just two verses in all of the Bible about Phoebe. Only two verses, but a woman who's had 2,000 years of impact and influence over many people. So what are the, I'm going to narrow it down to three things that you should know about Phoebe to inspire and to encourage women and, in fact, all of us as we strive for and pursue excellence in those areas where God has called us to work. So the first lesson is what I call the importance of being a reliable, trustworthy worker, especially when it comes to tasks big or small. Did you get that? The importance of being a reliable, trustworthy worker, especially when it comes to tasks, carrying out tasks, whether those assignments are are big or small. Paul writes in Romans 16, I commend to you Romans Phoebe. Our question is, what was this woman named Phoebe doing in Rome? She was a citizen uh, of the uh, suburb of uh, Corinth. It would be about equivalent, this suburb of being like Byron is to downtown London. About seven or eight miles outside of Corinth was where Phoebe was from. But we see here that she is in Rome. Why is she in Rome? Uh, Was it a business trip? Uh, There's a pretty good case that could be made that like Lydia, the woman we looked at a few weeks ago, um, this is another businesswoman who was on a a trip to Rome. Was she uh, on vacation? Maybe she had decided to take a Mediterranean cruise from Corinth to Rome. Um, Was she visiting relatives? Well, that's a possibility. I kind of lean more towards she was on a business trip. But Paul sees the opportunity and uh, gave Phoebe an assignment. And most scholars argue, and I agree with them, that it is Phoebe who delivered the epistle to the Romans to Rome. Now, you might think, well, that's not a big deal. That's about as exciting as pulling weeds at the back of a car dealer uh, parking lot. But this was a very important assignment. You, you realize that back then, you didn't have photocopies. Um, there was no uh, ability to email or a fax the epistle to the Romans. And given the rigorous process in, in, in writing documents back then, there was likely only one copy of Romans. And Paul entrusted Phoebe to be the one to deliver it. A long trip, always dangerous back then. This was not something where Phoebe could have gotten away with saying, oh, I misplaced it, or I, uh, I, I think I left it somewhere. No, she realized it was an important assignment. And I can imagine Phoebe glowing as uh, one of the leaders in Rome read through this magnificent epistle we know as Romans. And think about it for you and me. Yes, it's the Holy Spirit who inspired Paul to write, and we believe it's the Holy Spirit responsible for the transmission of Scripture through the ages, but he uses uh, human resources, and, and Phoebe was instrumental in getting this epistle to the Romans and indeed to people like you and me. So as we enjoy many aspects of this incredible epistle known as Romans, we think of the role of Phoebe. Uh, When I think of this kind of trust and confidence Paul had in Phoebe, I think of the souvenir certificate that we give out at a wedding. 
Uh, now, the Form 7 part of the legal document is the officiant's responsibility. So when I officiate a wedding, I make sure that gets to the Receiver General. But on the document, there is a what we call a souvenir certificate that is to go to the bride and groom. And before they receive an official certificate, it's a very handy thing to have. And I've learned over the years that there are certain people that you can trust to make sure this document, this souvenir certificate, gets to the bride and groom. Now, on the wedding day, you might think, well, the best man is the best person to rely on. I've learned the hard way, not always. In fact, guess who I find is usually the most reliable, trustworthy person? The mother of the bride. Almost without fail. Uh, whether it's because she has a vested interest in making sure that uh, everything is uh, official and in order, but that's one of those things that... Uh, I've learned. How reliable or trustworthy are you when it comes to work, whatever the context may be? For you, it might be washing dishes. And you wonder, does anybody notice? My family doesn't seem to appreciate it until we run out of dishes. And then it becomes a big issue. Or what about in the workplace? You're good at writing those big reports. But what about a report? Think of teachers going back to school. What about the 20th report card that you've done for a pupil in the classroom? Does it really matter? Does it really make a difference? Or are you uh, trustworthy and reliable in providing your best effort? and pursuing excellence in that way. It's one thing to manage a, uh, a business team, but how are you when it comes to mentoring that new guy, the new woman who has started in the workplace? Or think about the church. Can God trust you? Can he rely on you to use your spiritual gifts the talents he's entrusted to you to serve others in his church. When it comes to some of those simple things that can be overlooked, like sending a card to someone who's sick or shut in, going, you know what, I think I'm going to make a phone call to that person I haven't seen for a while here at Byron Church. Or maybe... I'll bake a cake or make a pie and get it over to that family who are going through a rough time. How trustworthy or reliable are you when it comes to work, whether it's a big task that everybody seems to notice or it's something behind the scenes that really does make a difference? Now, there's a second thing that I want you to notice, and that is Phoebe's passion and commitment to community. I'm a great believer in community and, and teamwork. So you think of a family. The families these days, with all the pressures and stresses, need a sense of teamwork. Uh, think of a business or think of a factory and teams that are involved in, in that way. Uh, think of uh, staff that you are a part of. You need team players, those who are committed to the community that you're developing. And of course, teamwork especially applies in the context of the church. And what I so appreciate about Phoebe was her commitment to the community of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you notice that Paul has actually an unusual way of describing Phoebe. It doesn't maybe strike us as unusual, but it's one of the only places in the New Testament where someone in the singular is referred to as sister. A lot of Bible references talk about sisters and brothers in Christ, but here we have Phoebe called our sister in Christ. A sister in the context of Corinth, 
but also a sister in the church universal in the context of Rome. A sister because of the bond that uh, other believers experienced with her, this bond that is in Christ. So a few months ago, I spoke at a Power to Change event uh, with uh, Western University. And uh, after I spoke, they had a few games. And one game that the students played was one of those games where they asked the question, uh, who has a blue comb? And, you know, you'd have to be the first one up with a blue comb. Or who has a, a birthday closest to Christmas? Uh, other questions. And, th- and then the question was asked, who here this evening has the most siblings? So someone went up and he said, I have four siblings. Another person went up and and she said, I have six siblings. I waited for a little pause and then I walked up. Those who knew me were kind of looking strangely. But I said, well, you know what? I have thousands of siblings. In fact, I likely have over a million siblings And these university students were looking at me like I had three heads. But I said, they're spiritual siblings. They're my brothers and sisters in Christ. Hey, never minimize that description of Phoebe, our sister in Christ. The other thing we see about Phoebe was Paul exhorts them to treat her in a manner worthy of the people of God. This is good instruction for us. And as I look out here this morning, I see people like you who are of significant worth and value to God. It's why Paul's friend Peter writes, um, the people of God are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people, a prized people belonging to God. What a way for us to view one another. Not just as an ordinary person or not just, oh, there's Bill or there's Mary. No, we need to see each other beyond that as people of incredible value and worth. But what really stands out here is the notion here of Phoebe's attachment to a specific local church. She identified with and affiliated with that church. Paul doesn't say, I'm commending to you Phoebe. Uh, She is a believer in Christ. She is a sister in Christ. But she's really not affiliated anywhere. She kind of floats around from this little church in Corinth to that little church in Corinth. She's kind of like a free agent. No, Paul was able to say there's a very specific church that she identifies and is affiliated with. She um, is active. She is engaged in that church. I've said this before, and I want to say it with a lot of force this morning. Paul would be shocked that there are believers in Christ in 2022 who do not identify or are affiliated with a local church. I think Paul would say that's, that's almost impossible not to have that kind of identification with a local church. And we see that uh, Phoebe exhibits the privilege and the responsibility of being able to identify with a, a local church. Over this summer, I've been talking to a lot of different pastors in a lot of different places in Ontario and, in fact, even broader than that. And in 2022, there is a very disturbing trend. And that's the number of believers who uh, have opted out of local church life. They are not participating in, identifying with, or being affiliated with a local church. Now, I'm so glad you're here this morning, and you might say, well, that doesn't apply to me. Uh, You might be listening online, and I sure don't want to guilt you. I want to be motivating you through grace. But I believe with all my heart, this is a trend 
that the church has got to reverse. There has to be a renewed commitment to the church universal and to the local church. Because never forget, God purchased the church with the very blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Does that matter? Does that make a difference? Jesus has promised that I will build my church, but he wants us to engage and to cooperate with that effort. So again, what I appreciate about Phoebe is her commitment, her passion for the local church. Uh, the final thing you need to know about uh, Phoebe was Phoebe is a model of a servant leader. A servant leader. Now, how is Phoebe described by Paul? He says she is a deacon in that local church. Now, here's where the debate goes. Uh, in some translations, we read that she is a servant in the church. And that's appropriate because the Greek word diakonos is ably translated servant. Where I struggle is the same word is applied to several men in Scripture, usually in the older translations translated that they are deacons. Um, so I'm a bit of a stickler on interpretive consistency. So if this fellow is called a deacon with that word diakonos, then I think it's appropriate to call Phoebe a deacon. Was she a deacon by function or a deacon when it comes to position or role? Little insight, the word deaconess doesn't get used in the church till much later in the development of the early church in the second and third century. So interesting, isn't it, that Paul refers to Phoebe as a deacon. To put it in very practical terms, I believe that uh, Phoebe would have been on the board of deacons, similar to our church council here at Byron, and I'm a strong advocate and supporter of women uh, participating and involved on our church council. A leader, a deacon in the church. But the function part is really important because we're all called to serve. And in fact, service is one of the major um, contributions that any deacon, if you want to use the word deacon as you can, but it's a major function that needs to be applied to all of us. And especially those who might uh, serve in, in this manner, in this way. So when it comes to this idea of service, another aspect I see in these two verses is Phoebe is a minister of mercy. One of the best books I know on deacons is a book by Alex Strzok. I years ago roomed with Alex Strzok at a conference in Chicago. Uh, Alex Strzok has written the book uh, Biblical Eldership, uh, Biblical Deacons. Um, I don't agree with Alex on everything. He would argue that the position or office of deacon is only for men, but he makes a lot of other very good and sound arguments. And one of the things he pushes is the idea that one of the prime responsibilities of a deacon in the church, in fact, of all of us in the church, is a ministry of mercy. He argues that it's about people. We need to prioritize meeting the needs of those who are needy those who are hurt, those who are sick, those who are shut in, the widows and the widowers. This needs to be a real priority when it comes to this area of, of uh, mercy. If you look at the establishment of deacons back in Acts 6, this sure fits that model, a minister of mercy. In fact, I think one of Strzok's best arguments is that we have a tendency with a board of deacons or a church council to prioritize the building function, kind of like a quasi-building committee, or the financial role, kind of like a quasi-financial committee. Now, you would agree with me, the building and finances are very critical in, in a church's health. But Strzok argues that 
the board of deacons needs to especially focus on meeting the needs of people in collaboration and cooperation with elders and pastors. And I think he makes a strong argument and something for us to even think about in our context here at Byron. The final thing under this servant leadership uh, idea is Phoebe's described as a benefactor. It's a difficult Greek word to translate. It means a supreme helper on one hand, but here's the trick. It also has strong leadership connotations. So when Paul uses the Greek word that in some translations, like the one I'm used, that's translated benefactor, uh, it actually means one who... um, not only is providing supreme help, but is likely leading others in that regard. So is it possible to think of Phoebe as the chairman of the uh, missions committee, chairman of uh, the, the board of deacons, the council, uh, chairman of the Sunday school? We could go down a whole long list. Now, we're not going to bog down. I'm not going to talk today about the distinction of elders and deacons. Um, Should women be elders? We'll leave that for another time. Um, But for today, I want to really get this idea across that I strongly believe women should have leadership opportunities in the church. Because you know what? When the Holy Spirit distributed gifts... One of the gifts is leadership, and there's no gender distinction. The gifts are given to everyone. And we have been so blessed here at Byron Community Church because we have women who have been gifted with leadership and are using their leadership in the buildup of the church. But here's the key as we close. It's servant leadership. We're not talking today about power and authority. Power and authority get so often abused and We're seeing some terrible examples of that with pastors and others in church life these days. The model is servant leadership. We're all called to serve, right? But if you are called to lead in any context in the church, it's about servant leadership. It was Robert Greenleaf in 1970 who wrote the classic essay uh, about servant leadership. But I got news. The idea of servant leadership can be traced all the way back to our Lord Jesus Christ with his towel, the one who prepared breakfast for his disciples, the one who served even to the point of going to die on the cross for us. Five characteristics that Greenleaf and others have pointed out for a servant leader A servant leader values people. So if God has called you to lead in whatever capacity, whether in the church or other places, remember the importance of valuing people. The second quality is humility. There's no place for pride and arrogance in leadership. Philippians 2, we are not to elevate self, but we're to lower self and to think of the interests and concerns of others above our own. And then there there are qualities like being a good listener. So a servant leader is a good listener. Uh, Being trustworthy, we've kind of covered that, and someone who truly cares for others. So if I was to give you a report card, I'd give Phoebe a, a good A, A+. But what about you? Um, are you someone who can be counted on? You're reliable and you're trustworthy. Whether the task is big or small, be it in the home or your business or especially here at the church. Are you a person who has a passion and a commitment to community? You uh, are determined to build up and to be part of uh, the the Byron Community Church team. And finally, um, if God has called you to leadership, be a servant leader. And if you are called to be a follower, pray that those of us who are called to lead 
will lead out of that model. We need, more than ever, men and women who are biblically strong spiritual leaders. When I think of work as we close up today, I think of our Heavenly Father, who is a wonderful model as well of what it means to work. One of my favorite verses is found in Philippians 1 and 6. We're confident of this. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion until the day of Christ. Doesn't that encourage you? When you might be bogged down by the pressures and stresses of life, wondering, is this all there is to life? Will things ever get better? Maybe you have a loved one who is struggling in his or her faith, even to the point you might even question his or her faith. God commits to this. It's not about you. Our Heavenly Father is the source of our confidence that the one who began the good work, even if there's times where we wonder if things are progressing, God has promised to bring it to completion. And I don't know about you, but with every year, we look more forward to the soon return of our Lord Jesus Christ and the reality and the prospect of heaven. So we're going to do something a bit different as we close. There's a handout that you should have received. And uh, we're, going to, we're going to watch uh, this song, but you can sing along with it. You're going to note a remarkable difference in how Phil Wickham leads worship and how I led worship this morning. Maybe there'll come a day where I'll be able to lead worship like Phil Wickham But let's enjoy this song. May it be a a celebration as we close our service this Labor Day Sunday, this song entitled Hymn of Heaven. At the end of it, uh, I'll just have a, a brief benediction.